Folks, welcome back to the Open Air Atheist Podcast. I am James Theater, still the third, and I have a very special guest on with me today. This is uh, DT Strain. He has a blog on Blogspot, and he is a humanist minister who has been studying uh, Buddhism for the past seven years. So I thought it'd be interesting to uh, I know most probably of the listeners of this podcast are probably atheists and I, I can't help but think there must be some, uh, some type of spiritualistic atheist out there, uh, whatever that might mean. And so I, I thought that this might really kind of be interesting, uh, to my fellow skeptics. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, DT strain. Are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks for having me. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. uh, Well, uh, I'm an artist and a writer, uh, and by profession, I've also uh, been in marketing. And um, I, for a long time, have been very enthusiastic about philosophy. And uh, I'd say that's what kind of led me out of my... uh, out of the belief system that I grew up with, which was... uh, uh, Protestant Christianity, and um, from there led me on to uh, non-theism and then to humanism, uh, and uh, now I'm also consider myself a spiritual naturalist, and um, that's a fully naturalistic worldview, but where there is a uh, spirituality in a naturalistic context, a series of practices and and perspectives on things. No. Um, and that's where I came across Buddhism, and I'm also <laughs> interested in Stoicism and the intersection between Western ideas. Now, when you say spirituality, can I get you to elaborate on that just a little bit? Sure. Um, I use it in, uh, and I, I understand that some people use uh, associated with uh, spirits and ghosts. But when I use the word spirituality, what I'm referring to is uh, what I think is a more universal and foundational version of the word. When most people say that they're not religious, but they're spiritual, or that they need spirituality, um, they may have a variety of beliefs. They have beliefs. Uh, that may contradict one another. But what they're really getting at when they say that is that they uh, have a certain view of the world or a certain approach to the world and a certain approach to practice in their life that is aimed at uh, self-improvement and in character improvement and uh, having a more flourishing, happy life. And so spirituality, for example... Um, the Latin word of that is spiritus, which literally meant wind or breath. And so uh, it is the essence of something. Right, or pneuma, Greek. Right. Yeah, the, the very uh, the inner essence. It wasn't necessarily uh, originally about some kind of supernatural spirit. Um, and so by that, when I say something uh, referring to spirituality, what I'm talking about are those things that are the essence of things, the essential in life. And um, that would be as opposed to the mundane things of life. And uh, so I think it's important for people to have a, uh, a sense of uh, the sacred. And what I mean by sacred is set apart. Something that is uh, those things that are the really deep and important things in life have to do with our ethics and our character. No. I'm not sure what you're doing there, but you seem to be fading in and out, and I was wondering if maybe you are uh, not talking into the mic correctly or keep maybe moving away from it. Or Oh, okay. Uh, 
I may be changing my head. <laughs> I'll try to speak more into it. But I am also hearing the passing of cars on your side. I don't know if that might be affecting it. Well, no, that's not affecting it, but at least okay. not on your end. Um, but I apologize for that. I'll try to keep that to a minimum. Oh, it, it, it's okay for me. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'll try to face my head more forward. But anyway, that's uh, that's what I mean when I, I use the word spirituality. And I think there is a naturalistic spirituality, and I think it's actually the original spirituality. Um, when you uh, look at, for example, the ancient Greeks and even the Buddhists, um, quite often the things they're talking about are not some other realm. They're talking about the natural world around them. And uh, uh, so that's what... That's what I. Uh, well, of course, all they're all they're talking about is either matter or energy. I mean, are we aware of anything else? Um, I don't think that. Uh, you know, my beliefs are based on what's been proven through empirical evidence. So well, that's why I'm a naturalist. I uh, I think that I agree with uh, Carl Sagan's principle of. The degree of belief in a proposition should be proportionate to the degree of physical evidence for it. Um, in fact, I think that having that kind of a rational approach to our beliefs is a matter of humility, and humility is a matter of spirituality, and by that I mean real spirituality. Um, to me, uh, claiming to believe things that you don't really know are true or that you don't have evidence for um, that's not spirituality. That's maybe a, a kind of uh, stand-in for spirituality. Right. I actually recently did a video on on this subject, um, and it was entitled Blahway, question mark. And basically the reason why I insert Blahway in there instead of God is because do we really even know, especially when it comes to, you know, Orthodox Christianity, do we even know what God is? Because you can't conceptualize him. You can't even call him a him or an it because everything we know that is a him or an it or a thing is physical matter or energy. And so what you're essentially doing is you're not going off the information you have. You're trying to jump ahead and right. to speculate and... Uh, when I ask a person what God is, that is the uh, fundamentalist Christian person, uh, I never get an, an answer in the positive. I always get an answer in the negative. So God is not material. He's not subject to space and time. Uh, the same thing with the soul. Yeah, the when I've been asked uh, uh, before, do you believe in God? Um, there have been times when I've answered, God who? Um, you have to... Tell me what it is you're talking about when you use that word. Um, but I, I don't typically use the word God to describe anything I believe in because I think uh, that would just be too... I mean, I'm obviously with my use of the word spirituality, I'm not opposed to trying to forge new meanings for words, but to me that's just too personal, personified to stand for anything that's in my world. Right. Um no, I guess uh, what I wanted to <clears throat> get into here was Buddhism. Um, what, have yes. you, what have you gleaned from your study of Buddhism thus far? Well, um, I've been studying Buddhism for a number of years, and I've attended uh, a very nice local Buddhist temple, and I've spoken with uh, different monks and attendees there, and uh, like I said, I've done some reading, and I've done... Uh, with people online and uh, a lot of research and studying and writing and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm not an expert in Buddhism by far, um, nor do I consider myself a stringent enough practitioner to feel worthy to call myself a Buddhist. But um, I'm definitely enthusiastic about a lot of the ideas in Buddhism. And I think that... Um, there's some very different fundamental things about Buddhism as compared to a number of other religions uh, 
that put it squarely within our realm of concern as naturalists. Uh, for one of the, for one, Buddhism is uh, not so much about what you believe as what you do. Um, it has a series of very practical sorts of practices and ways of, of living that um, can quite easily show their effects, and not through some, you know, magical means, but simply because of human nature and in the nature of the world that we live in. Another fundamental difference that I think uh, there is between Buddhism and a number of other religions is that with a number of other religions, uh, you have essentially a, a core mythology, and on that core mythology is built a number of prescriptions that flow out or mythology is typically supernatural or faith-based kind of story or account of things. Whereas in Buddhism, the, the foundation of the start of it is that um, things beyond our world, beyond life and death and, and that sort of thing and those kinds of questions, uh, the Buddha said were um, irrelevant to religion irrelevant to true religion as well. And instead, what he, he focused on was how to um, escape from suffering, ease suffering, um, reduce suffering in this life, in this world. He said those are the things that are relevant to religion. And the, the methods that he practiced were very much in line with a naturalistic approach. And then what happened after that is that Buddhism flowed out into a myriad of different cultures and places and uh, uh, areas where, as it did that, it, it evolved and it broke into various schools and um, it got mixed with the local uh, superstitions and local religious beliefs. And so now what you have today is a wide range of practices and, and beliefs called Buddhism. And Quite a lot of them are very supernatural and, and faith-based, but I think there's a core there that's uh, a very rational sort of approach. It, it seems to me uh, Buddha was more um, interested in, in effects and not in cause. And um, Buddhism so far in my study of it, uh, and I'm really new to this, but has it's a very pragmatic thing and I, I run into people who say it's a philosophy some people say oh no it's a religion some people say it's it's both um, <clears throat> some say oh you 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 have to believe in reincarnation in in the immaterial um, you know spectacular sense and there are some that say oh no no you don't have to do that at all um, some treat it as a lifestyle. Uh, some seem to treat it as a, you know, a religion uh, with core dogma. Yeah. Um, and and so I've I've heard you know a lot of different things, and I know there's also a, a skeptical Buddhist podcast, um, which is pretty interesting. I've been listening to that, and there's actually a group that meets uh, called the Skeptical Buddhists, if I if I'm correct, um, that meet in Second Life, which is a uh, online uh, world, if you will, uh, computer-generated world where they meet in this little computer-generated uh, cabin and, uh, you know, commune with each other and, uh, I guess, do meditation and stuff. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Fortunately, I haven't been able to uh, make it to any of their meetings yet, but uh, um I tend to at some point just to kind of get a better idea of what it is that these, um, you know, what, it, what, what is the understanding of these people as far as Buddhism is concerned? Um, so have you noticed any tangible benefits from uh, Buddhism? Do you, do you apply it to your life in any, any sense? Yeah, um, like I said, the uh, um, my practice is uh, imperfect. 
and uh, my discipline is imperfect. I work on that all the time. So I don't practice as well or as often or as steadily as I would like to, but it's something I'm always working on. But one thing I can say is that the, uh, the study of Buddhism has really changed the way I look at things. And it's not so much a matter of, uh, oh, I believe in this or I don't believe in that, so much as it is a general perspective on it. Um, and the way those perspectives fit together to form my value system and the things that I choose to focus on and the things that I choose not to focus on and the things that I choose in the way I choose to live my life. And that has had a profound impact on my life um, in ways that have really enhanced my experience, my life experience. Um, I'll give you an example of uh, a very personal and and, uh, powerful example is when my mother passed away. I was, uh, um, I'd say I was maybe a year or two into serious level study of Buddhism and also of uh, Stoicism, by the way. That's a, a, a Western Greek, ancient Greek philosophy. Well, folks, we lost the, uh, we dropped the Skype call there. Um, so I apologize for the connection. Uh, we're having some technical issues. But I have uh, DT strain back, so let's try the best we can to, uh, you know, begin where we left off. So you were talking about uh, Stoicism? Yes. Um, Stoicism, ancient Greek philosophy, uh, it has a lot of overlap in its concepts with Buddhist concepts, in my view. And I've been studying that as well. And um, more than studying, but actually trying to put into practice these things. And so that was sort of permeating my my mindset, um, when my mother passed away and when that happened, it helped me not only endure, but it helped me, um, integrate the experience in, into my, my life in a way that, uh, that I was much better psychologically. I was in a much better psychological place. I had a peace with it. Um, now, of course, nothing's going to ever, you know, remove uh, pain and suffering completely. There's going to be bad things that happen. But both Stoicism and Buddhism um, had a really big effect on my perspectives and my uh, my way of handling uh, handling things when things don't go your way. I guess you could say. So is there a, I'm just kind of curious about Buddhism in it. And I know when I say Buddhism, I mean, that's really a loaded term because there isn't any one Buddhism, at least with the information I have thus far. Um, I guess there, is there a self in Buddhism? Is there like an immaterial self? Actually, the Buddhists uh, say exactly the opposite. Um, there's a concept in Buddhism in English, it's sometimes called no self, no dash self. Um, and it has to do with the concept of emptiness in Buddhism, but what it boils down to is that, um, a person, what we think of as a person is not one single thing that you can point to and say, that's me. Instead, what it is, it's a, it's a, Aggregate. It's it's a aggregation of of different aspects of different faculties of different functions. Um, you have memories. You have feelings. You have thoughts and ideas, um, habits, tendencies, all kinds of different uh, instinctive responses, impulses, perceptions. Um, you have all of these different things coming together in a complex interaction and that is a person and when these constituents uh, are taken away either literally or mentally as you examine the issue in your mind and you and you say well am I mem- am I my memories 
no. Am I this? Am I that? And you keep peeling away the layers. You find there is no thing that you can point to that's continuous and, and without change and permanent that you can call the self. Now, this conception certainly uses general descriptive terms that would be available to ancient people. But at the same time, it also describes uh, the way we understand persons today with our understanding of atoms and neurons and brains and all of these different components interacting with one another. And a key feature on both descriptions is that um, the self, the person, is impermanent. When these uh, patterns of interaction cease, so does the person. And this, this notion of impermanence gets to the core of what I think is a significant thing you can say about a lot of philosophies, um, is that just about all of these life philosophies, religions, and, and worldviews and things, uh, they fall into these two general categories, as I would call them, uh, and they have to do with how you deal with the subject of impermanence. Um, obviously, we live in a world where things change and uh, the things that we get attached to and that we like to be around go away, um, including our own lives. We have a strong sense of uh, self-preservation that, that we want to uh, keep surviving. But that also applies to all kinds of other things through life. And these two categories are basically um, different ways of dealing with that reality. Now, in the one category, you've got philosophies that um, the way they deal with it is they try to convince you that there is something that's not impermanent. They try to convince you that there's a, a permanent something that you can attach your hopes to. Um, in the case of, say, Christianity, for example. Uh, but they can never be, tell you what that something is. <laughs> well, you know, that that could be God, the afterlife, you're going to live on forever, all this thing. They, in, in other words, the, the general approach of that first category of philosophies or religions is to try to deny that there's impermanence. The second category is to accept that there's impermanence and... It says, okay, how do I deal with that? How do I come to terms with it? How do I uh, make peace with it? And how do I live in an impermanent world and still be happy? And and Buddhism falls into that second category. Huh, okay. Um, but obviously, I mean, matter and energy is permanent because it can't be destroyed or, yeah. You know. Sure. But I, we're talking here about ways to be happy and to live a happy life. And so um, the things that we tend to get attached to are those impermanent things. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Um, because everything is always changing. And when I was a child, um, my dad used to drag me around the country uh, up until the time I was – till he died when I was like 14. So almost – 14 years of uninterrupted moving from place to place. And, you know, you make friends and then, boop, time to go. And, you know, you, you get comfortable here and, up oh, time to go. And, and so I guess early on I learned uh, about impermanence. So sure, I can yeah. definitely identify with that. <laughs> Just about everything. I mean, uh, relationships and uh, jobs and money and health and, all of these things, um, uh, both Buddhism and Stoicism, uh, are all about how to deal with that. And in the uh, in the Buddhist tradition, it has to do with forming, a, uh, learning how not to form a, attachments through mindfulness, and uh, that makes a very good fit with the Stoic approach, which is um, to keep in mind those things that we control and those things that we do not control. Mm -hmm. To attach our happiness and concern to that which we do control. And uh, so these are the kinds of strategies that have found their way into <clears throat> modern renditions of these ideas like uh, rational emotive therapy and, and uh, a host of different self-help techniques today that um, can really uh, be credited to 
those earlier ancient ideas. Right. Um, so it's it's not about life after death or going to heaven or any of that. It's it's not about. Um, I mean, what would you say to these people that believe in, you know, reincarnation in the sense that, you know, you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to come back as an insect or something if you, uh, you know, if you have bad energy or if you do something sure. negative in this life or I'm not sure how that works, but, um, yeah, there's a, would there's you a- say that that is a part of Buddhism itself, or is that more of a later, um, you know, something that was in, incorporated into Buddhism? Did do you think that Buddha, with your studies thus far, um, do you think the original Buddha actually believed? Well, it's real difficult to uh, <laughs> try and nail down what this person actually thought or believed who lived thousands of years ago. And whose writings and whose words weren't put into writing until well after that. So, um, one of the things that you'll hear monks say, or at least that I heard monks say, is that when you ask them questions like, well, did Buddha really do this? Did he do that? Did he think this? Did he say that? Um, unlike, unlike some other religious counterparts, uh, what they'll often say is, it doesn't really matter. Uh, an actual Buddhist monk told me it doesn't matter whether the Buddha existed or not, whether he said this or said that. What matters is the efficacy of the teachings. Right. And again, that, it, it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Again, uh, that's what it seems to me. It's um, it's about what works. I mean, it's it's very pragmatic, and I think that that can be harmful. Uh, it, but I also think it could be very use. you know, obviously it's useful. Um, but I think that, you know, some people can conf- confuse that with, oh, well, this, this works. So it's true. Well, um, but I'm know, not saying a problem if you say that, uh, this works, so it's true. And you're either wrong about, uh, the results or you're, you're giving, getting overly attached to some description of. Uh, the cause behind the results. Um, but, you know, the, the Buddhist concept of the Kalama Sutra is what they call That's a teaching. And it basically says, don't believe anything because your teacher says it, because it's in scripture, uh, because it's traditional, because some other authority tells you. Um, believe what you're going to believe because of experience, because you tried it out and you saw what it was. Now, as far as... Um, uh, you know, thinking that it works, therefore it must be true. That can be a problem when the claim is something other than uh, happiness. Right. <laughs> when when the claim is subjective, it's okay to basic. I mean, basically, there's no such thing as placebo at that point. Um, right. I, I, I wasn't saying that. You know, that applies. Uh, you know, to to everything. You know, is this is this metaphysically true? You know, I don't think that's really the question or what people are trying to get at in in Buddhism. It's more of does this work? Does this produce a happier you know individual? Right. Now it's care- it's important that we be careful not to confuse that with uh, um, say for example somebody says, well, you know, I believe that. Jesus is going to is going to wipe away my sins, and uh, he's going to save me, and I'm going to be able to live forever in heaven. And that makes me happy. And because that makes me happy, therefore, that's okay to have that belief. Right, um, right. This is something quite different. What this exactly. is is saying: here's the claim. If you do this practice, if you meditate, if you increase your mindfulness, if you uh, act more compassionately toward others, if you live in certain ways you will experience happiness. Now, it's not saying that if you do these things, you will make a giant dragon happy with you, and therefore he will magically bestow happiness in your life. There's not this intermediate uh, sort of mechanism that it's claiming. It's just claiming that these things will make you happy because they're in line with your nature as a human being. Um, 
And, and now, you know, with modern science, we can get into the details of why they make you happy. We can look at the effects of meditation on the brain, and we can look at uh, social studies, which uh, talk about, you know, the way people interact with one another and their effects on human psychology and all of that. But really, that, that, gets, that boils down to something else that <clears throat> is a story in Buddhism where the... Uh, uh, it's called the uh, parable of the broken uh, parable of the poison arrow, I think, and um, it's basically an analogy that says, okay, a person's been hit with an arrow and poisoned, um, and here's something that will remove the arrow and cure the poison. Do you want to sit here and have a conversation about that, or do you want to remove the poison? So. Um, Again, like you said, he was very concerned with the practical and, and what have you. And, and it really is two different endeavors. Um, one where you're trying to build a practice that will make you a happy person. And two, where you're trying to understand every single little aspect of it. That's Those are both worthy and important endeavors, but we have to remember that um, throughout human history, we're constantly trying to get more knowledge and we're basically working on a on a sailing ship. Um, and so each individual person, uh, you know, they have to build a life practice that is going to be conducive to their own happiness. And uh, personal experience is, is a good way to uh, do that, or at least it's superior to just accepting something because of a, an authority figure. Right. Um, what? This kind of puzzles me. What is enlightenment? I mean, a, a lot of people are throwing this around, and I'm like, you know, and I, I haven't had anybody tell me really what it is, and I'm like, well, this is your goal, but you don't even know what it is, so how would you know if you ever reached this goal? Um, right. what, what is what is enlightenment to you? Because you're studying this far. You... Well, that's kind of like saying what is God to different uh, religious people, but... right. <laughs> it's going to it's going to vary based on your worldview. I mean, obviously if 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 I were a kind of a, a supernatural Buddhist, then my idea of enlightenment might have something to do with transcending to a higher plane or something. Yeah. <laughs> In very practical terms though, I would say that um, it's not this on-off boolean sort of state where um, you're either enlightened or you're not. Um, I think we all go through stages of enlightenment throughout our life. We, we hopefully reach higher and higher levels as we grow and learn and develop. And ultimately, I think it's about uh, character development. And I don't mean that in the Western sense of uh, learning to behave yourself according to some code, but rather uh, building the habits and virtues and qualities of, of your mindset and your uh your awareness of of the world around you, and awareness of your situation, and awareness of the uh, uh, of the results of your actions, that as you gain more and more understanding and more and more wisdom in life, that the fruit of that wisdom should be that you uh, enjoy greater contentment and happiness, despite. Um, the uh, random fluctuations of circumstance. Right. Um, I guess I kind of want to focus on your comment that, um, you know, everyone, if I, I hope I don't misunderstand what you're saying, but it sounds like you're saying everyone kind of experiences or a lot of people experience a certain kind of in, a character, uh, character enlightenment or whatever, um, I think that's kind of, I think that's pretty true. Um, I, if that is what you were saying, <laughs> um, I'm well, an atheist. I mean, uh, they do to a certain degree. Some people stall, some people, uh, <laughs> kind of, uh, have sharper curves than others. And it all depends on their intentions and their motivations and their actions and, and right. their progress. Right. Um, you know, this is open-air atheist, and, uh, you know, I'm an atheist, and that tells you about what I am not. 
but it, it doesn't really tell you what I am. And what I am, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, is a realist. You know, I want to know what is the case, uh, regardless of, you know, whether that truth is comfortable or not. Um, I strive for consistency. Uh, I constantly examine myself and see if I'm practicing what I preach, so to speak. Um, and I think that is a, a form of, or a path to enlightenment, a type of enlightenment. Um, yeah. when we examine ourselves, um, deeply, uh, our motives and, um, you know, we, we look at, you know, how we treat others and, and, a lot of times I examine my motives when I'm involved in refutations against, uh, you know, a Christian. Um, you know, what are my motives here? Uh, is it to just win an argument? Um, is it to build up this person and to uh, not tear them down? You know, what, what, is the, what is the focus? What is the purpose of this? Um, and also, you know, when I critique people, um, I always try to take that same criticism later when I'm by myself and really think, well, am I guilty of this fallacy? Um, I, I was doing this back when I was an open air preacher, um, back in 2010, when I was, uh, on a, on Huntington beach with, uh, Ray Comfort and, uh, you know, I, I, I was doing this back then. There's something about critiquing others that um, can also to cause you to critique yourself, whether it's preaching or, you know, doing refutations as an atheist, uh, rationalist. Um, I find that a lot of times when we look at our own consistencies, we're also able to better understand and to identify others, other people's inconsistencies. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think those are all, uh, you know, I, I think everything you expressed, those are all very noble efforts and noble uh, thoughts and intentions. But I'd, I'd also want to point out um, some additional things that, that I kind of came to, uh, you know, I, I moved, uh, from atheist to humanist and now to this uh, secular form of spirituality. And one of the reasons that I've moved in that direction is because uh, exactly what you said, you know, I, I started becoming less concerned with what I wasn't and more concerned with what I am. And I wanted to talk about those things, you know, what do I believe? What are my values and why? And what what are my practices? And as I um, as I moved in that direction, um, what I found was that uh, you know we we quite often in our community are uh, you know we tend to be very concerned with um, the intellectual. Um, here's what I know. Here's here's the facts. Here's how we discover the facts. Here's how we discover, or here's how we keep, um, you know, the nonsense out. Um, and, and then we go about debating people and, and so on and so forth. And we, we, we think about this information and this knowledge. And, um, you know, those, those are very important things. But, uh, but they aren't everything. But, you know, the... The ultimate fact is that we don't have, you know, all of the knowledge, obviously. We're constantly learning. And um, I found that I was in this state where I thought, okay, I'm going to keep focusing on this stuff. And eventually, when I get it all figured out and all known, then I can start living it. And, um, you know, I eventually realized, well, you know, you've got to start your your knowledge has to somehow affect your actions at some point and you may not have perfect knowledge when you have to take those actions so so what do you do um 
you know, here's an example. I, I used to look at uh, the field of ethics in a very analytical way, um, in a very westernized way, where I had these ideas about, you know, this is what ethics is, this is why something's ethical, why it's not, these structures, these these uh, uh, structures of consequence of if a person does this, it causes this, this are, is ethical. Are this you talking about utilitarianism? In a sense, um, or? Things like utilitarianism. Yeah, I'm ca- talking about that whole category, that whole way of thinking about things. And, um, you know, then I then I got into some situations um, with family and whatnot where um, events were highly, highly complex. And all of my analysis and ways of fi- trying to figure out what's the right thing to do in response to this crisis, um, were very feeble because I didn't have complete information for one thing, and I didn't have complete understanding of exactly what the results of my actions would be. So it became very impractical to take that approach. When you say and that that depends on your goals, on what the right thing is to do? Well, even, even knowing my goals, it, it became very impractical to know in a realistic way, how to achieve them um, because they involve the actions of other people. It was just a very complicated situation. So what I finally realized was that, um, you know, I'd been reading a lot about compassion and had started to become very convinced in the power of compassion and the, the things that compassion can achieve and the effects it has on people. So I just decided I was going to fall back on compassion. I was going to act from compassion in all things. And sure enough, the situation worked out. Now, I'm not saying that every situation is always going to work out if you do that, like it's some magical you know, spell or something. But um, what I found was that there were a lot of, there are a lot of uh, general principles and general character traits and virtues and things like that. And I started to shift after, after I saw you know, how that worked and how it was a lot more practical and it got the job done um, in a much superior way than any of my ethical theories could have ever achieved. I, I started realizing that of those things that we don't control, one of them is how much information we have or how much knowledge we have. And at any given moment, you know, we're having to perform here. We're living our lives. We don't get to wait until we've studied everything and know everything before we start having to actually perform in life. And so I started moving more toward a, a virtue-based concept of, of ethics and a character-based concept. And, um, you know, that really plugged in exactly with some of the things I was reading in Stoicism and Buddhism as well. Huh. Uh, go ahead. I think the way you're describing it is a bit vague. Um, I have an idea, I think, of what you're trying to say, um, but not exactly what you mean and how sure. that applies. But as I was saying before, in order to assess what right and wrong is, you need to have a goal in, in mind. Like some people might say, you know, right is whatever causes less harm. Okay, so my goal is to cause less harm. Well, well, how do I go about doing that? And that's where, you know, it stems from. Well, um, I think that's true, but... I think that's true, but... Uh, you no, know, just to elaborate a little more from what I was getting at, um, consequentialism, this, this idea of something is right because it, it will end in some certain ends, some certain uh, uh, final state. Um, That could be put on one side, and and then another way of looking at it could be to come at it from the angle of motivation. Uh And um, what I've found is that we don't control outcomes, and we don't control our knowledge of how to get those outcomes necessarily. I mean, we can do the best we can do given what we, you know, we can be responsible, we can try to be rational, we can try to be, collect the information and process it as best as we can. We certainly should do that. 
But ultimately, we don't have a lot of control, especially in highly complex situations like that. And so um, what the Stokes would say is that you should focus on what you control. And what you mainly control um, is not out external outcomes, but you control what kind of person you are. You control your motivations. And if you have pure motivation, if you have not, if your motivation isn't sullied by greed and and uh, ego and, and all kinds of things like that, and your mo- motivation is good because you have a good character, because you've developed a good character, and because you've developed practices that allow you to stay mindful in as these situations arise and not get distracted by your lower impulses, um, then what happens quite often is that you can find your way using, of course, your rationality and the evidence and, and reason and logic. Um, but you can find your way a lot better. And when those uh, situations, when those final uh, results, those, those uh, consequences come to be in a certain way, if they're not what you wanted them to be, then you haven't placed your attachments on that. You've placed your attachments on the knowledge that you did the best you could do and you, were, you did the virtuous, you made virtuous choices. So, in other words, this is kind of what I'm gleaming from you, Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you're saying in order to achieve less harm, you must become less harm. Um, That's a good way of putting it, sure. And and now certainly because of our lack of information, because of our, our lack of knowledge, we might accidentally do harmful things, even despite good motivations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if we have really been responsible and we have done the best we could do, then that accident will simply be the result of uh, the imperfections of being a human being. And we can't really hold ourselves to, uh, you know, we can't really get too upset about that because that's the nature of the world we live in. Right. Um, For example, you know, I'm walking down the street street and next to a pool and I see someone playing in the pool and it's a kid and he's drowning and I nobody else is around I jump in I try to save him but I just can't get to him on time well uh you know I can't I if I if I know that I did the best I could do um then all of the matters of how that played out you know after it left my brain, you know, how the atoms interacted with one another. That's all a matter of what the Stoics call the logos, the underlying rational order of the universe, or what we would call today the laws of physics. Right. (laughs) It's just how everything played out, you know. And uh, there's a lot that goes into that perspective that has to do with accepting things without being uh, uh, fatalistic, because... Along with that goes the the you know the qualifier that I have to do the virtuous thing in order to have something to, to say that I that can feel good about myself. Um, and often the virtuous thing includes things like trying your damnedest to save that kid in the water. Right. Well. So. This is just an example of some of the kinds of perspectives and ideas and thoughts. But the key thing uh, about these in Buddhism is that they work very well in a in a impermanent, interconnected, interdependent universe. Now, some people think that that they imagine all kinds of spiritual stuff in that mix. But whether they do or they don't. The, the end result is that that description of the universe fits very well with atoms and physics. Right. I, so um, therefore, forms a good foundation to the philosophies that follow from that. I've heard quite a few claims from Buddhists lately, um, and they seem to believe that Buddhism is in line with quantum physics. And what I, I don't know, I'm not a scientist. So I'm not making a judgment on that. Um, There's no way I can make an educated judgment on their claims because I'm not a quantum physicist. 
Um, there is actually a, a series of videos. I think it's a three part series on YouTube. Um, and it, it basically goes into some quantum physics and tries to show how, you know, Buddhism is in line with that. And, and I don't know if you've heard this, but if you have, maybe you could give me your take on this, this claim. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, like we talked about at the outset, there's a lot of different kinds of Buddhism. And uh, I think that probably, if I had to guess, those would be coming from the um, end of the spectrum that's more the supernatural, uh, uh, mystical kind of take on Buddhism. Uh-huh. And the reason I say that is because it's very common for New Age types and uh, various other sorts of faith-based um, believing people to take quantum mechanics and kind of distort it, um, saying that it means more than it does. There's some weird things in quantum mechanics, to be sure, but um, that notion of the observer create, created reality gets taking it, taken out of context. Yeah, that's one of the things that I heard. <laughs> and so people like to use that to justify all kinds of things like psychic powers and whatnot. And you'll find uh, uh, some Buddhist people who say things like, oh, if you become good enough at meditating, you'll eventually be able to levitate and all this, you know, stuff that we simply don't have evidence of that, anything like that. Now, isn't the one of the Buddhist claims that all is mind or? Well, I, I don't know about that phrase, all is mind. Um, I think what happens is there's a misunderstanding about um, what Buddhism says about reality. Some people believe that Buddha's, Buddhism says that everything is an illusion. Well, that's not exactly right. That's not what Buddhism is saying. It's not saying that everything is an illusion. What it's saying is that, I mean, Buddhism doesn't deny there is a reality. Right. But what Buddhism says is that the way we conceive of reality is quite often mistaken. And uh, what they mean by that is, <clears throat> for example... Um, we tend to classify and categorize things quite often in very blunt pigeonholes. And that that creates expectations and limitations to our way of thinking about things. And so what happens is we end up uh, forgetting forgetting about or denying the interconnectivity of things or the complexity of things. And so, for example, in reality, what you have are, um, I'm going to veer into some scientific language here, but I think it describes the essence of of what this is about. Right. Uh, In in reality, you have particles, uh, matter and energy interacting in a space-time continuum according to the laws of physics. And all of these complicated things are happening from the quantum level all the way up to, uh, you know, huge macro level. And in that interaction, at our scale, at the macro scale, we look at solid materials and we think that's solid, you know, and we, and we say that is a chair. We, we take that bundle of atoms and we call it a chair, or we say, uh, even more deceptively, that is a river. Um, well, later, all of the particles of that river are going to be displaced by other particles and uh, we're still going to say it's the same river, so it's really not. And that seems very arcane and, and very uh, kind of overly picky or obscure or whatever. But what it illustrates is there's this... Um, you just said the of, word... Uh, I'm sorry. You just said the word arcane? Uh, what I mean is esoteric, yes. It seems very esoteric or, or removed from anything practical, to realize that, but what it's illustrating is that there there are a number of things that um, that really are only a certain way because of our judgments about them, and because and it's not that our judgments affect the physical structure of what's going on. It's because we've decided how we're going to label those things, how we're going to value them, how we're going to um, describe their interaction with one another. And that works its way all the way up the scale to society and people and uh, history and ethics and everything else with which we deal. And so um, that's the very beginning 
of realization that starts you down this path where you start to re you start to look again at, at things in a new way um, and you you realize that how much over time your judgments have intertwined into your conception of the world and when you start to take those apart um, you start to see just how much your happiness is dependent on your your focus um, not so much on the actual positions of those atoms and what they're what's going on with them but on how you view the universe you know two people in the very same situation same finances same injuries same health same whatever and you can have one person uh, content and stable and, and with a level head on their shoulders and another person panicking or in terror or in despair. Um, and a lot of that has to do with that kind of perspective. So that's what they're talking about when they say that, you know, you know we, we say a lot of things just as though they're just patently true. This is better than that. This can never work. That can never work. This This is what this is for. This is what this is not for. And um, we don't really examine, you know, the essence of what we mean by those very often or stay conscious or aware of them. Right. Uh, we tend to try to put things in a box. Um, we perceive only so much with our senses. Taste, yeah, and, we, touch, and not smell, only that. Sight. We, <laughs> right, not only that, but we also... Uh, by drawing these divisions, we, we neglect to appreciate how interconnected everything is. We say, well, that person shouldn't do this, or that country shouldn't do this, or this is what they need to do. And we don't realize just how much our own actions are causing the situation we find ourselves in. Hmm. It's kind of like the... Uh, you know, it's really interesting to me studying anything Eastern because so much of it intertwines with one another. Um, uh, for example, the the Taoist con to the Wu Wei effortless action, where instead of just moving against the grain, you you tailor your actions to be in correspondence with the way of things, the way things flow. That that can be found in the philosophy behind Judo, for example or you use the momentum of the per of your opponent against you. Um, likewise, there's a, you know, you've seen the Chinese finger trap, right? Yeah. Where you put your finger in and you try to pull and you can't get it out, but it, if you gently twist, then, you know, what you thought took a lot of force only takes a little bit of force. Um, these kinds of things are the, are the kinds of, uh, uh, are, are quite often found in, in nature. And in, by nature, I mean in the world, in, in our situations we find ourselves in politically and interpersonally and what have you. Um, I want to go back to something you said before, though, about uh, – about, um, well, I'll, I'll come to it later. I can't think of it right now. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, could you give us a, a nutshell in, in – uh, what you know, Buddhism is what it teaches. Uh, like, does it have like tenets? Um, sure, and I'm glad you asked about that um, because I'm I'm often kind of reluctant to get into the whole thing about reincarnation and uh, uh, rebirth and uh, karma because not because you know I'm trying to hide them or I don't want people to know about them. They they have there are naturalistic versions of those things. But the main reason I I, uh, I prefer to talk about other things is because they take up the time I have that I would talk about what is really the essence of Buddhism, the core of Buddhism. Um, and I would say that uh, Buddhism starts off with four noble truths. And, um, you know, the four noble truths are, one, uh, life is suffering. And by that, it just means there's going to be suffering in life. Suffering is everywhere throughout life. Um, two, suffering is caused by attachments or craving for those attachments. Three, suffering can be diminished when the attachments are diminished. And four, 
um, the path of Buddhism is about learning how to do that. Um, now that's really a good summary of, you know, where Buddhism is coming from. And in fact, it, it jives very well with the ancient Greek, uh, approach, which is the, what they called eudaimonia or flourishing, the flourishing life, mm -hmm. the life. And by that, what they mean is this, this sense of happiness and contentment that transcends the ups and downs of your material circumstances. And the way they went about that is very similar to the way the Buddhists go about it, which is developing, uh, following uh, disciplines and practices which, um, over time, form your your perspectives and your character into a, a way of dealing with the world that allows you to be, um, in Sto Stoicism's case, more aware of what you control and what you don't, and in Buddhism's case, um, less attached to those things beyond your control that are impermanent. And, uh, and so what it's all about is, is being a happier person. And by that I mean true happiness, not uh, shallow happiness. And so the Four Noble Truths are usually one of the first things that people talk about when they describe Buddhism. The second thing is, um, you know, there's the Eightfold Path. Uh, most people have heard of that, they have looked into Buddhism. And now the, uh, the specifics of the Eightfold Path are one thing, but generally what the Eightfold Path is, is about behavior. You know, you do this, you do that, you don't do this, you don't do that. Um, have to do with right action, right thought, right, you know, these various different things. But um, what that whole thing boils down to is is ethics, but a very different take on ethics than is thought of in the West and thought of in, in uh, religions like Christianity. In the West, we have a concept of ethics that's like, you know, there, here are these rules, and you better follow them, because if you don't, you're going to get found out, and you're going to get punished, whether by earthly people or by some afterlife business going on. Um, and most people understand ethics to be like that. We need these oversight committees, and we need people to teach kids, and we need people to punish them if they don't do it. Um, we, we think of ethics as a sacrifice, something you form yourself to because it's for the greater good, and, and you don't want people to be mad at you, and uh, you know it's for us all to get along. And you know, kind of like how you you pick up garbage because we don't want pollution everywhere. But that is completely opposite of the uh, Buddhist approach to ethics and the ancient uh, Greek approach to ethics and, uh, I would say, as against a secular approach to ethics. And their approach, uh, to the contrary of that, is that ethics is about wise living. It's about wise life practice. Ethics is ultimately for our benefit. And in fact, uh, the Humanist's Manifesto says that um, ethics are to be judged by their effects on human happiness. And that's exactly what the Eightfold Path is about. It's not like if you do this, you're going to be punished. Not You're not going to be punished by God. And also karma is often misunderstood as some form of punishment, which it isn't. Um, but rather, if you do these things, you will um, be the kind of person who is more capable of enjoying this higher level of happiness. And you will experience, uh, you know, the kinds of things overall uh, that you want to experience. Um, it's just wise living. It's like brushing your teeth. It's not that, uh, you know, you've got to do it because of some uh, authoritarian rule set. So you're, you're doing it because of the benefits Right. Not of, and what the Stokes would say is that you're walking in accordance with nature, and that includes human nature and our nature. Um, that it is we are social beings, and it is ultimately within our nature to live as social beings and to uh, uh, live according to our higher abilities. Um, and that when we do so, the evidence that that is right or that that is ethical or that is the way to live 
is the fruit of that, which is our our happiness. Um, do you do you meditate at all? Yes. Um, what what kind of benefits have you gleaned from that? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, meditation is is one practice. There are a lot of other practices um, that I've gathered from Stoicism and Buddhism. And by practice, I don't necessarily mean something where you sit down and you say, okay, now I'm going to do this practice. A practice can be uh, a way that you're going to try to be. You can, uh, it could be your demeanor. You know, you're going to try to have a certain demeanor. Or you're going to try to keep a journal where you uh, keep track of your progress. Or you're going to um, perform certain rituals. Um, and I'll get to ritual in a minute. Uh, but... Uh, to be more specific to your question, uh, yeah, yes, I meditate, and like I said earlier, I don't do it as often or as regularly as I should. But now, when um, you say I uh, noted big benefits from it, and I can talk about specifically what those are for me. And no, hold on. Before you do any of that, let's define <laughs> terms. When when I said, "Do you meditate?" Um, and you said yes. What are you saying yes to? Because there are a lot of, I think, um, misperceptions about what Buddhist meditation is, um, you know, kind of like zoning out your mind, going blank, and where the devil can come in and take over. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, what, what, what is meditation actually? Yeah, meditation is actually not zoning out your mind. It's a very active process. Now you can see some you, when you, you know when a, when a person looks at somebody meditating, they just see a person sitting there with their eyes closed, being real calm. Some people just imagine it to be this thing where you're just relaxing and calming yourself, and it's just this stress relief thing. But it's much more than that. Um, what's going on inside the mind of a meditator is something very specific and very disciplined. Uh, and and I'm going to describe breathing meditation, which is the most basic form of introductory Buddhist meditation. Um, like I said, some people think that they can meditate and astrally project and try to do all kinds of other stuff. But this is the most basic universal form. And right. I, I, I went to a, a Buddhist meditation class in, in Second Life, and the mm-hmm. guy kept saying, go in between the thoughts, you know, stay, something like that, like stay in between the thoughts. And I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> How do you yeah. do that, you know? And um, what it came down to is sit down, shut up, and focus on one particular thing instead of jumping all over the place. I mean, if yeah. he had just said it that way, I would have gotten it right off the bat. But I, I think I spent most of the time just trying to figure out what, what his terminology was. Yeah. Some people try to be overly impressive with flashy language. And what they're really doing is they're taking some of the terminology that came from bad English translations <laughs> uh, that sound very, you know, esoteric and everything. Like a lot of Christians do with the King James. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's really obfuscation, and that's really just egotism. Um, and maybe it wasn't conscious egotism, but, you know, ultimately, clear communication was, is what's important. So what's happening here is that in meditation, um, it's one thing to say, okay, you're going to sit down, shut up, focus on one thing, and, and, and what have you. But it's important to know how to do that and why you do it. Um, right. What you do, I have an article on my, my website, humanistcontemplative.org, and it uh, in the blog section of that website, uh, there is a, a how-to on meditation. And... It goes through all the steps, but basically um, the problem is that, you know, we talked before about mindfulness. You know, one of the the things you have to have is mindfulness um, in order to know that you're reacting to things in a certain way. Now, what is mindfulness? I'm sorry? What is mindfulness? Okay. Uh, Mindfulness is is a constant state of awareness of, and by awareness I mean your surroundings, but also your inner uh, mind. Now, you've seen people before, I'm sure, that have no mindfulness whatsoever. These are people who are uh, enraged or they're completely unconscious of how their behavior is affecting other people. 
for um, they're basically just taken away with the wrapped up in the the emotional immediate uh, pullings of their mind. Self centered. Um, well, that's more of a character trait that can lead to those. But I'm talking about specific instances. Okay. And so, um, yeah, sometimes self-centered, but sometimes not. Sometimes, for example, a person who is, uh, you know, just going completely distraught because of their concern for somebody else. Um, that's a person who has lost all their mindfulness. They're completely wrapped up in the emotional drama of their minds. And what happens is that our minds are constantly going from thing to thing to thing to thing. The Buddhists call this monkey mind. You're all over the place. And if you've ever tried to go to sleep at night but you can't sleep and your mind keeps spinning its wheels, thinking about all kinds of crazy stuff, um, that's also an example of a lack of mindfulness. Um, And so what mindfulness is, is it says, well, if something happens and it's going to make me mad, if I'm mindful of my inner state and, and I have this kind of watching eye over me that's myself looking at myself constantly, then whenever I start to get mad, I, I can be removed from it and I can be aware of myself getting mad and that will diffuse the anger. That, that makes it where I can see the larger situation. You know, when I look at somebody else and I see them getting mad, you know, I can see it from the outside. I have an existential view of my stuff. Um, And that takes attention. And that kind of attention is not something that's easy to maintain, especially as different things arise in your everyday life and you start becoming, you just sort of mindlessly drawn to them. You do this, you do that, and you don't even think about it. Um, So in order to do that, you have to have a focus. You have to have the ability to... Maintain attention on the thing you want to maintain attention on without your mind getting to dictate it and pulling you in all kinds of crazy directions. So what meditation does, this kind of breathing meditation is, you sit there, you close your eyes, you start breathing. Normally you focus on the breath. And the reason they do that is because the breath is always with you. You can do it anywhere, in the subway, whatever. Um, But it can be anything. Sometimes it's a a thing they say or whatever. But the key thing is it's this constant thing, and you focus on it. And as you're focusing on it, and there's a lot of little details to this people should read too, but as you're focusing on it, um, you'll notice that your mind will try to veer away. You'll focus on it for a while, and then sooner or later, oh, I need to go to the grocery store, or what did that guy tell me I needed to do with my car? Or, you know, you've got all these different things that will come up. Right, fears and concerns and whatever. As these things happen, you recognize it, you set it aside, and you go back to the breath, and you keep doing that. And what you notice is that over time, if you if you really meditate as you should on a regular basis, then uh, what you'll notice is that your ability to maintain that focus will get longer and longer before these interruptions happen. So it's like and, building a muscle. Yes, exactly. You're building your ability to maintain focus. And then um, what you'll notice, too, is that uh, right after you're finished meditating, if there's going to follow meditation, you'll be able to zero in on that person talking, and it's almost like tunnel vision. It's Your focus will be so sharp, you'll be amazed with it. It might take a few sessions before you start getting to that point. But then your focus can become diffused by all kinds of other things. Uh, Media is very uh, commonly diffuses our focus. But we maintain this focus. And then the reason for doing that in meditation is that you also develop an awareness of your surroundings and where you are. It's kind of like if you throw a pebble into a raging ocean, nobody notices. But if you throw a pebble in a very calm water, the ripples are very noticeable. So if your mind is still, you have still mind, calm mind, you're able to direct your attention where you want it to be and not where your subconscious is pulling at all times. Well, you're the first person so far to really make it make sense to me because, like I said, people are using a lot of terminology that I'm just, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, there's a lot of layers of language and culture 
and different takes on it and different interpretations. And that's why I think it's really important for somebody to sit there and parse this out for for naturalistic, secular people. Because I think when they do, um, it makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of really good gems in there. And and to get back to the, uh, the mindfulness thing is that once you have that mindfulness, the idea is that you take that out of your meditation, uh, just like working out a muscle, you go out and use those muscles, you, and you, there's a sort of semi-meditative state you try to maintain throughout your life. Um, the meditation is really the easy part because here you're making it easy on yourself. You're, you're putting yourself in this little quiet area where there's no distractions, and you're basically isolating down that little quality. But you're trying to get good at it so that when you're out in an environment of great distractions, sometimes great emotional uh, tugs and all kinds of things like that, right. that you maintain that equanimity. Um, now, that's just one little part of Buddhism and one little part of these kinds of philosophies. But um, that illustrates kind of the nature of, of these practices and, and how it really is about practice. It's not just book learning. You can read all you want about Buddhism and meditation and everything, but you're never really going to understand its effects unless you actually put them into practice. Um, it's kind of like reading a cooking book but never actually getting in the kitchen, making anything and eating Right. Well, I mean, could you imagine if if we had all of this knowledge uh, but never applied it? I mean, I probably would not be sitting here talking to you on a computer (laughs) or any other electronic or technological advice or a device um, because you have to apply that knowledge in order to have these things. And that's why practice is so important. That's the difference between a... uh, a spiritual path or even a philosophy and academics, the thing that's called philosophy in schools, the academic version of philosophy. Um, that's a huge difference. Now, if somebody did want to read up on this um, naturalistic form of Buddhism, um, or just some good you know, things to start out to, to understanding Buddhism and what it really is in its essence without all the mysticism and all that, do you have any recommended reading, Um, recommended books? Let me... uh... I I know that you have written, uh, and I I would advise all of my viewers to to go and check out DT Strain. Uh, They're in Blogspot, and he has a nice uh, section on um, Buddhism. Yeah, you can actually get to... <clears throat> that just by going cubistcontemplative.org um, What was that again? I'm sorry, you kind of cut out. Yeah, it's humanistcontemplative.org Okay. And I got that uh, term, by the way, uh, I mean, I didn't get the word contemplative here, but I had known about that before, but I got the idea for using the word contemplative actually from Sam Harris. Oh, Okay. Yeah, um, Sam Harris, toward the end of his book, The End of Faith, talks about some of the benefits of attention practice and things like this. And he says that what we actually need is a secular, contemplative, um, uh, you know, line of investigation or, or something like that, he said. But he used that word contemplative, and I thought that was a really good word. And so um, that's when I started the Humanist Contemplative, and we formed Humanist Contemplative groups um, in Houston, and um, it is also inspired one at Harvard. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I would uh, recommend is a, a book called Buddhism Without Beliefs. Who's the author? It really sounds familiar. Yeah, um, the author is, uh, I don't remember it, I'm looking at it right now, Stephen Batchelor. Oh, okay, so he's the the Buddhist monk that came out atheist. Um, yeah, I guess, so So that, that book there is a, is a very good one. And like I said on my website, I, I talk about naturalistic interpretations of karma and rebirth. Um, on my blog, I have a... Uh, a thing called Meditation 101, and uh, it goes over details of that. Um, I have some other entries that talk about the Kalama Sutra. I think if you do a search on my blog that you'll find for Buddhism, you'll find uh, 
a lot of different articles there. And um, I also give sources in a lot of these. So those sources you can then track down and see where I got that. Okay. Um, d- different little segments or factoids from. Uh, yeah, so that's that's probably where I'd start. Is there any other book you might start with? <laughs> um, well, you know, quite honestly, uh, most of my study of Buddhism has been the uh, has been in textbooks about Buddhism, in other books just about Buddhism in general, and at the I would recommend if somebody's really interested, go to a temple and talk to monks. Um, I think you'll find that the Dharma talks there are um, far more pragmatic and practical than uh, you might guess they are. Right. I um, I went to well, there's a Buddhist temple here where I live. I haven't gone there yet. Um, like I said, I've gone to one online, <laughs> uh, through second life and have talked to, uh, some people. Um, and they even have a little library in, in, in there, yeah. or not a little virtual library. And they have a little thing in there where you can click on the screen and hear a Buddhist, uh, talk. Um, and I've learned to kind of reinterpret their mysticism into <laughs> something naturalistic Sometimes uh, you have to do that, but um, quite quite often you'll come across uh, uh, different temples and, and different uh, traditions where they're not really you don't really need to uh, reinterpret it that much. And I was surprised at the temple that I went to. The temple I go to is the uh, Jade Buddha Temple, and they're very uh, um, they stay in like a lot of core Buddhist ideas because they serve a lot of different kinds of Buddhists. There's different schools of Buddhism. And you might notice that Theravada Buddhism, spelled with a T-H, the, is... The uh, uh, oldest, isn't that the, uh, they try to get down to the, you know, original or right. oldest teachings of Buddha, correct? And so you'll probably find uh, a lot more compatible with your views there. And then uh, Mahayana and Tibetan Buddhism get progressively more um, mystical seems to me. Now, that's not totally true um, categorically. You know, there's there's some mix going on there, but generally speaking, that's that's what it seems like to me. Huh, okay. Um, yeah, I think the temple here is uh, Mahayana. Um, the, the most, I, I think it's the biggest denomination, if I can use that word, in Buddhism, as far as yeah, I know. Sure. I mean, and, you know, it really just depends on that specific community, or Sangha, as they call it. Sangha? Sangha. Sangha. Um, yeah. Sangha. Sangha. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, there'll be some searching around for people, and, and like you said, you may have to reinterpret a few things. Um, but what I've found, though, is that quite a lot of these things I thought were reinterpretations, when I actually go back and, you know, uncover what they were probably really talking about, um, it's a reinterpretation of a reinterpretation where you find that the secular naturalistic reinterpretation seems to me to be actually closer than what it has become since. So, But it really doesn't matter um, in the right. end. And I think that it has maybe... our own takes on these things. There can be a, a uh, uh, naturalistic Buddhism. Right. You know? Buddha, Buddha was not... Uh, even according, he was not like infallible. He was a human being. He was a product of his time, just like we all were. Sure. And I think that we need to be cautious and to say, you know, admit that, hey, he was a product of his time. There are some things that he's going to say that is merely a product of his time, uh, or that you know shows he was he was part of the fabric of his time and affected by that fabric. Um, but yeah, there are absolutely. also some things that we can glean from that and take from that, take from his from his teachings. And he may have been talking about, well, I'm sure, I'm almost positive, he was talking about physicality, because as far as I know, that's the only thing there is. He was just yeah. using different terminology, and he may not have, you know, understood that. Right. Uh, you know, instance, it's just like with, uh, uh, it's just like with, a lot of the ancient uh, Greek philosophies, they, they say things that, you know, we would think of as, well, that's not exactly right today. They might talk about Zeus or they might talk about, 
um, Olympus <laughs> from time to time, things like that. But ultimately, the approach of Socrates, for example, was a rational approach. He had, at the time, what those were were hypotheses about the physical, natural universe. Some of those didn't pan out and others did. But if you ever went up to Socrates and said, well, I believe this because I have faith in it, um, that wouldn't have gotten you very far with Socrates. Same thing with Buddha. Right. I, I was going to um, ask you something, and this is really not a big deal or anything, but I was just kind of curious on what your take is. I am holding in my hand right now uh, a little green fat dude. Um, people call Buddha, but he's really Budai. And what I was wondering is, um, where does this guy come from? Do you know anything about Budai, the little fat one that the he's not the Buddha, but a Buddha? Yeah. Um, where um, is that? All I'm just not mystic. Sure about the history of that, but I know that uh, you know Buddha was not considered to be fat. Right. <laughs> he, he believed in the middle way, which is moderation. Um, that's after being going through a phase of asceticism. What you will find is sometimes you'll find statues of a very bony skeletal Buddha. Oh yeah, yeah. And that Buddha is uh, more accurate in that, um, if the story is true, that. He went through a period where he tried asceticism yeah. and uh, found it not to be helpful for enlightenment either. And that, that's when he came up with the middle way. And uh, But as far as the, the fat Buddha, I think that's more of a cultural thing. I, I don't know exactly where that I heard from. that he might, this was a Chinese monk that actually existed, but then all this, you know, legend and stuff kind of came from, you know, it, it, it grew into legend and, and was legendized. Um, well, I, I thought maybe it was just to get people to order more Chinese food or something. Well, it's used now as a marketing device. I mean, you look at Santa Claus, right? Santa Claus was a real person uh, over a hundred years ago in Germany. And, uh, you know, but what is he today? Well, after through all that filtering and, you know, yeah. extra added legendary crap and marketing gets thrown in there. That's true. The real Santa Claus is totally disfigured into something that is just not the real Santa Claus. And um, what I I know that the real Buddha wasn't fat. But when I when I look at this little Buddha, it kind of um, I kind of reinterpret that and I say uh, maybe this is how my character should be. I, should, I shouldn't be physically obese, but maybe my character should be happy. And uh, should be content, and um, uh, you, sometimes you'll see him with little children playing on him. Yeah. Um, so I see this as kind of a character, not necessarily a, a, you know, a physicality. Um, yeah, and, and that's helpful. I mean, we can always leave that kind of stuff to the historians or to Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, there's even a lot of stuff I wouldn't even trust Wikipedia on, but... Um, well, yeah, follow those uh, resources. Yeah. yeah. Follow those links. Yeah. Um, wow, well, you've really shed some light. i, I got to confess, I mean, the only thing I know about Buddhism is what I've watched in Little Buddha with uh, Keanu Reeves and uh, uh, some YouTube videos for some monks and, and uh, you know, Second Life. And I've been dying to read uh, Bachelor's book. Um, Buddhism without beliefs. I just haven't. I've watched a few interviews. Yeah, I recommend it. And, um, you know, I started out, the first thing I ever heard about Buddhism was, oh, that's those people that believe when you die, you come back as a cow. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's amazing the stuff that, you know, we, from our perspective, get obsessed with. But <laughs> Right. I mean, you could do that. I mean, I think any religion you can take useful things from it. I mean, let's take Christianity, for instance, uh, some of the teachings of Jesus. Um, loving your na- loving your uh, enemy, not just your neighbor, but loving and forgiving your enemies. Well, well how he was so... The most valuable things that come how, out of Christianity. Right. He taught sincerity. He taught um, a non-hypocritical way, you know, self-examination. Um, you know, he, he taught about... Uh, compassion, um, you know, it isn't like we just need to scrap Christianity altogether. We can take these things that we know to be true, that we know to be useful, 
um, and 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 use that. We don't need to just you know, oh, the Bible is this utterly evil book; it needs to be burned like the Quran or something. Uh, we we can we can take what is useful out of that, what is you know um, beneficial to us, and and not have faith in it. But well, you know, there you know, is a uh, uh, there's a book called Christianity Without God. Yeah. <laughs> By Lloyd Gearing, and um, it's a very interesting book. I've got a summary of it in my blog as well. Wow! Um, where I summarize some of his points, and he makes a compelling case. It's quite difficult uh, task. <laughs> right, but, right. Um, well, the funny thing is, is that whether they want to admit it or not, um, with the information I have thus far, Christianity is without God, anyways. <laughs> um, that's a joke. Um, but what I'm saying is, is uh, man, what was I saying? Um, I think it was just basically that, uh, you know, there's good ideas all throughout human history and throughout all cultures and all over the world. And I believe in synthesizing good ideas. And, right. And I think what, by their results and, and bringing them together in a cohesive uh, understanding that's consistent with modern science. Right. I think where we get into problem problems is faith and dogma when we just say okay well this is jesus so everything that jesus says in yeah. these in this book here is fact uh that's that's where we get into trouble when we do that to any teacher whether it be a professor whether it be richard dawkins whether it be whoever uh we need to to realize people for who they are and that is uh fallible uh we all make mistakes and we can't try to fit people into this com- comfortable box and say, you know, and deify these people. Um, we're going to run into some problems. And w- when we go on faith, uh, you know, belief without sufficient evidence. Um, Sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, but I, I will definitely, I will continue my research of Buddhism. I've really been... Um, fascinated by it recently. I've spent hours online and researching and, and things like that, but um, it's been hard to really get uh, Buddhists themselves to really talk to me for a lengthy amount of time. Right. Um, and a lot of them seem to be... A lot of them I catch during meditation or, or right before they're about to meditate and of course, they're not very talkative then. Uh, so a lot of that may have to do with my yeah. timing. Um, well, you'd probably uh, be good. Um, what I normally did was I, I went to uh, um, the temple near me. They have a meditation, and then following that is a Dharma talk. And usually uh, there's a, a little bit of a break period between the meditation and the Dharma talk. And then also usually the monk hangs around after the Dharma talk. And so in between those times, I'd often uh, approach them and ask questions. Other people do that, too. And then, of course, the Dharma talk itself has a lot of good uh, materials. So, um, yeah, I would recommend, uh, you know, getting out and interacting with people in addition to the book reading. But then ultimately uh, trying to put some of it to practice and see how it works for you. Right. Um, well, that's that's just awesome, dude. I, I really appreciate you uh coming on the show uh been very cooperative i apologize uh for the technicality or technical issues that i've experienced today uh this usually doesn't <laughs> things happen doesn't happen um so i appreciate your patience and uh you know hope to have you back on at some point uh in the future um and if you you have anything that you know specific topic you would like to touch on uh, feel free to use this as your audio blog. Um, <laughs> okay, well, um, yeah, I, I'm sure I could come up with some other ideas. I really appreciate you having me. And uh, if, if you or anybody else wants to continue the conversation or have other questions or whatever, feel free to email me. Um, my uh, I can be contacted through my blog site at humanistcontemplative.org. And, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we'll keep it going. <laughs> All right. Well, folks, uh, I got to go ahead and wrap up this episode. It is uh, one hour and 34 minutes, which is the longest episode I've had thus far, Um, but definitely one of the most interesting. 
So uh, with that said, think for yourselves and whatever you do, don't die. <laughs>